I see I'm dealing with the same problems as usual, guys. This is entirely my this is entirely my fault. This is a bad Wi-Fi signal. My laptop has full five bars, but for some reason it just yeah. I, I see I see I'm shaking. I see I'm shaking on the deal. How's my audio? Well, I just can't win. Yeah, I see I'm glitching, guys. If it if it continues too bad, I will discontinue this video. I'm not I can't put up with it. My it, it triggers my OCD. But if the audio is good, I'll continue. I'm not shaking anymore. That's good. Audio's good. All right. All right. Yeah, I see when I move a little bit. It's not it's not StreamYard, guys. StreamYard works really well for other people. I know what it is. I I'm actually this studio is actually located very, very far away from the Wi Fi modem. It's not like my other studio where it's hardwired in. All right, since the audio is good, I'm going to go ahead and continue. We got a hell of a show today. I tell you guys about William Cordes all the time. Well, not all the time, but many of my video presentations, I have provided you guys evidence that William Cordes has gleaned from the scientific community on anomalies that the scientific world basically ignores. And they do this a lot. It's called practicing exclusions. This is one of the things that Charles Fort used to talk about all the time. He says how hypocritical the scientific establishment is. And it's not just the scientific establishment. Anybody, anybody who holds to the scientific models, there's a bunch of YouTubers that do. There's a bunch of YouTubers that strictly get their da data from NASA. They, sh th they tow the party line. And and they look down on free thinkers with pomposity as if as if just because you've learned to parrot what the textbooks tell you and not think for yourself is something that gives you bragging rights. It's ridiculous. I see some of these YouTubers that are out like criticizing some of the free thinkers, you know. You know, free thinking individuals normally come from uh, an uneducated, formerly uneducated background like myself. But we are able to analyze phenomena from multiple different vantage points which gives us an advantage we're not stuck to a paradigm you know we're not we're not believing simply rote facts that were we have to take on faith because uh religionists religionists are no different than those who come from a, a purely scientific background scientists like to pride themselves that Science is all about the observation of the you know, is about observation and the collating of data and facts but it's not true Anybody who accepts a scientific premise today accepts it on faith. If you can't replicate on a chalkboard what Einstein did about relativity, then you're taking those conclusions on faith. You're not taking them objectively. And this is a this is this is one of the things that that really just gets under my skin when when some of these some of these talking heads and on YouTube and uh, other uh, platforms uh, basically criticize. They don't criticize me because I welcome it. All, all they got to do is do a, do a video on me and I'm going to hurt their feelings. But I see how they target, they pick and choose their battles and they target some of these other individuals in the so-called truther community and they try to clown them. And, they treat, and you know what? The arguments are the arguments are so vapid. They're so they're so ridiculous and retarded. And the the individuals that claim to be espousing scientific principles are merely parroting things that they have taken on faith. It is no different than the Southern Baptist who goes home in Sunday afternoon watching football after he just took in a whole bunch of uh, 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 preaching uh, and, and singing with the choir. It is absolutely no different. They're they're both accepting a paradigm purely on faith because anything that you don't do in first person is basically you accepting the data of somebody else if you can't show it in the numbers or show it in the bibliographies you're just taking it on faith simple as that so one thing i i really like 
about William Cordes. I have two William Cordes books in my in my collection. You guys are going to get a video on that because those two books are relative to one another and they concern Uparts in strange and out of place artifacts, fossils, tangible items that we have found and excavated that completely defy explanation if you stick with scientific paradigms. But if you adopt the archaics model of history, all the all, all of them make absolute per perfect sense. If you accept the Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Ox Oxford uh, collegiate version of history, which is totally falsified and absolute BS and requires billions of dollars annually to continually to foment, to pay all these people like these 33 degree Masons out there who are hiding behind uh, their, their establishments and the fact that they are funded and they're able to do all these teachings and, and have millions of subscribers. Now we know who they are. We don't have to name them teaching these false paradigms, these morons like, 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 uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I would love, I would love to debate that man. I do not believe that just because a man appears on television and has been heard by millions of people that he possesses a modicum of intellect. I don't believe that. I believe that he's a puppet. Uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. What was What was he? What, what was he? An engineer? Yeah. Come on, man. Stop it. It's uh, yeah, these guys, these guys are put out there in the public for you to see and to accept this BS paradigm, this BS world that they have that they have basically sold to the collective, but they haven't sold it to you. I know they haven't sold it to you because you're listening to my channel and you listen to many other people's channels who are also trying to educate people about the real facts of our world, not the fictions, not the things they take on faith from the pseudoscientists. You can wear a white lab coat and say anything and the collective is going to believe you. You ball headed and tattoos, ball headed and tattooed out there trying to tell people the truth and cite your sources. Collective's not going to believe you at all because they've been trained. They've been trained to look at that white lab coat. This book here, I did a, I did a call out in past videos saying, hey guys, if there's anybody out there who's got some William Cordes books, especially the Source Project books, these are getting rarer and rarer to find. They're purging these books. They're not easy to find. And they and they also discontinued publishing William Cordes. These books are fantastic. He is a more modern and more scientific Charles Fort. He read Charles Fort, but he took Charles Fort's uh, material to a whole nother level. I have educated you guys on Charles Hoy Fort on the four books that he has left to posterity. They are fantastic. Many of my videos cite those sources and evidence, but this man, unlike Charles Fort, comes from a scientific background. He is a scientist. Now, this man here, William Corliss, is giving us the business. And I'm about to break some real interesting facts off to you guys about our world that most of you have never heard before. Things that are phenomenal. So this book is the subject matter of this video. This is Handbook of Unusual Natural Phenomena, Eyewitness Accounts of Nature's Greatest Mysteries. This is all about phenomena. The next William Cordes video that I do is going going to be about fossils and artifacts, actual things that we have, we have held, touched, excavated. But this is about phenomena, and, and every, every single source cited is scientific. It's very interesting stuff. So let me wet this throat, this here coffee. Because we're on an adventure, I had to wear my adventure hat. Yeah, guys, I, I don't know why I've been sitting on this. I keep thinking it's going to get better. I, I don't know why I'm sitting on this. I promise you, as soon as this video is over today, I'm about I'm about to take care of this. This uh, this this studio is going to have to be hardwired. There's just no way. Wi-Fi just won't do it on on streaming. It requires too much bandwidth. And, and I'm real. My live videos have to be really good. So I, I this this me shaking around. I apologize for that. But this can be the last time this happens. Let's see. All right. So before I start this video, I want to I want to show you guys something very interesting. This uh here. I don't have permission to name and I don't know if you'll get in trouble for sending me this. I don't know, but uh I re I recently released my montage videos on on the Phoenix uh Big John had edited that that those 82 videos down to 7 videos. 
And uh, after after this guy here in New South Wales saw this, remember, guys, I, I, I cited Fort and other sources that a tremendous amount of red mud and red dust was dumped on Australia in 1902. It was a Phoenix year. Well, I got pictures of it. I got pictures, measure, measurements, sci actual scientific analysis. Here is the homogeneous layer, 1902, 1903. Shows the depth of the material. It shows really interesting aggregate, which is also something that's, that's a part of the Phoenix phenomenon. Several times when this red dust falls, also rocks fall with it. They, they've afflicted armies. They've tore up towns before, all that. This is, it. This is in the historical record. So we have a clean... In interface between the bedrock and the homogeneous layer this homogeneous layer is red earth red mud it's red dirt it's it's uh it's got it's got a uh, mixed in it are these uh, these same type of stones so this aggregate so this guy send me all this drawing attention to aggregate now i know you guys can't see it close i just wanted to share what somebody has sent me uh the clean interface between the strata evenly weathered upper upper bedrock surface so he's showing the bedrock surface here that's the that's the original surface that he circled right here. I know you guys can't see that very well. I just wanted to share this. And all this material seems like it was dumped because of the scientific analysis that he provided me. Very interesting. It's, now this is suspended aggregate. This is this you gotta understand. This could not be flood sedimentation. This could not, this is not alluvial. You have to understand the difference this is an anomaly because you have this light feathery dirt red dirt dust type stuff and you've got these stones light stones that are aggregate that is dispersed at different height at different depths if it would have been alluvial all the rocks would have went to the bottom it would have been layered but it's not it's like it all fell out of the sky together so all this is really interesting but it's what he it's a sci it, it, it's the it's the report it's a geological survey report statement of the environmental effects in support of development applications had to take the personal information out i get that but this is the land capability service new south wales australia it goes in here and there was a scientific analysis done on, on this on this clay all this uh fine structure slightly mo moist uh moderately plastic Oh, reddish brown, light clay. Oh, orange, an orange heavy clay lay, layer, but it's a weak structure as if it had just dropped out of the sky. Never been compacted. It, it too is slightly mo moist and very plastic. Oh, remember guys, we got 50 tons of this fell per square, square acre per mile. I can't remember, but Charles Fort talked about it a lot. He cited all the things that were going on. Remember, remember, 1902, ship captains had to call people on deck, man, just to sweep the stuff off their decks. It didn't just land on the continent. It landed all over the ocean as well. So I thought this was pretty interesting. 0% nitrogen. That is very telling. Soil all around the world has nitrogen in it because it's got plant. Plants are everywhere. But this area here, this red stuff here, 0% nitrogen. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty, anyway, I, I could go on. He wrote me a letter in the back. I thought it was really interesting. I don't want to give up uh, too many details. 0% nitrogen, low phosphate, but higher than average potassium. Yeah, which, uh, which would indicate to myself some type of ash type derivative. Uh, I also find of interest in how the quartzite and shale particles are in frozen suspension. What I tell you guys, this couldn't be alluvium. The, the 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 heavier the heavier rock materials would have sank instantly and all the lighter materials have been on top that's not what we find we find that they fell out the sky together that's what it looks like on the ground so i'm not a scientist guys i just wanted wanted to share with you what this what, what was sent to me and uh the proof the proof is in the pudding because here is red earth from phoenix fallout phenomenon in 1902 they got it measured in there. They, they, it even says 1902, 1903 layer right there on the paperwork. I don't want to take it out, but it's all right here. Smells like dirt. But uh, this is pretty interesting. I know some of y'all want to see this. It's just red dirt.
But this is what I've been telling you guys about all over the entire world. This stuff fell in 1902 out of the sky. Deep red dirt. So, that's just stuff we're going to talk about in this video. I'm sorry if you guys couldn't hear me. I got away from that microphone. Yeah, but science, you're an eternal pupil. You're absolutely right. Scientists aren't sci scientific at all. And there are areas. Thank you, Matt Kubis. Not my shirt. Thank you, man. So, We have so much. I normally make some small talk, allowing people to get in here and do that. You know what? We don't have time for that, guys. We're going to get into lightning, lightning storms, very strange phenomena that is found under the ocean, above the ocean, things that ship captains have seen. Very unusual phenomena all around the world. I'm going to show you a video clip. Many of you have probably seen this video. I heightened it up. I, 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 it shows a tsunami and something coming out the water. This is something that has been. Listen, guys. 2011, the Japanese tsunami. I know many of you have seen this video. It's famous. It got like 24 million views. It's on YouTube. And it shows a ghost-like specter coming out the water. But it actually shows the same thing at three different locations moving in the video at three different times. Well, I've been, I've been, I, I deleted all the extraneous parts and just focused on that because it's very relevant to what we're talking about here. Scientists ignore these things, but these exact apparitions have been seen in volcanic activity earthquake activity, thunderstorm activity, tornado activity, and tsunamis. So what's really going on? What are these things that can appear and reappear all around us in our world that science has basically laughed at, trying to call them foo fighters, trying to call them will-o'-wisps, trying to call them all kinds of different little names to denigrate fairy lights, spook lights, got a lot of names for them. But but sometimes the evidence is absolutely so overwhelming and compelling and recorded by other scientists that the, the denigrating scientists can't ignore it no more. So they have labeled these terms something that they can, that they can wrap their, their, their theories around without sounding ridiculous. Ball lightning, St. Elmo's fire. Yeah, guys, it's all the same thing. Charles Fort was very, very adamant in telling us that our world is not what you think. He also his also also his principal message using scientific documents of the time, three hundred years worth of records. Charles Fort wanted us to understand that we are not alone here. So let's get into that. Let me look at my let me uh Victoria. That's right. Hit that like button. You know, I, I hardly ever prostitute myself for likes and, and shares and all that. I really don't need to. I mean, I believe in providing value, and I believe as long as I provide you guys value, you know what? I'm going to have listeners, and I'm going to have people that support Archaics. I'm going to have people that are getting educated, and the sharing will come naturally. So, that's all. Uh, absolutely. Daniel? You can make edits of my videos and post them on TikTok. I've given full permissions for platforms to do that. There's no doubt. No doubt, man. Thank you, Colt fan. So ordinarily, I don't like to run over two hours, but we just might do that today because today I'm going to hit you with some facts, some amazing things. So before I really start this presentation, I'm looking over my chat, making sure I don't really miss anything pertinent. I know I got some fantastic moderators. Front row seat, I see you. Hey, uh, uh, Cheryl, I plugged Martin. Morse Demers, hey, bro. I I, I plugged Martin. I, I sent all that traffic to Martin. I hope I hope uh I hope they uh did it. But I haven't been selling drives lately because Don has been catching up, and we have sent so many coins, drives, and T-shirts as, as apologies for late late orders and all that. Making sure we're clear, we've cleared the entire list before we start our new digital system. We have a new, we have a new digital post little, uh, a, like a personal postmaster that automatically, automatically prints out the domestic and international labels. We don't have to do anything anymore. All the stuff that was really stopping us from, from being organized, Don took care of all that. And, uh, it, meanwhile, I just quit selling them and I've been sending everybody to Martin Leakey because I know Martin's got that library drive and he's got the, uh, the images, 35,000 images, uh, Antiquitech and all, 
couple kinds of old images. I know I gave him about a thousand or two thousand images. The rest of them are all his. He's got a fantastic library. So uh, I hope that I hope he's been uh, taking advantage of that. I was on a video with Danny and I sent some traffic his way. I hope he got some sales off that. Let's see. All right, man. Let's get on with it. Let's get on. Let me get to the bottom of my chat. Martin Leakey, hey, bro. We got to schedule another another uh, another uh live together, man. Martin's in the chat. A lot of people are in the chat. I just can't name everybody. Hey, Shiva Shampoo. Uh, I haven't got your email back yet, Shiva. If I, if I have, I'm apologize. I apologize. I haven't seen it. I've been looking because I want to do I want to do a a live video with you on the Mandela effect because you have more examples than anybody I've ever seen, and I want to uh, re revisit that topic. All right. So I do have some really interesting pictures here. Let me get them. Let me uh. Let me get those ready too. Get my picks ready. I'm gonna learn how to use this system a little bit faster. Not real sure. It says it has a slide. Martin Martin never taught me how to do the slide, but it says present. It just says I don't have any slides. It says share screen. Huh? Wonder how I put slides in there. Oh, my computer. There it is, right there. All right. Okay. I'm going to upload all these pics. All right. So I'm going to open that. All right. So I'm just going to have to show them one at a time because I don't understand the system. It's not letting me do what I want to do. So we'll get to that in a minute. It's just weird. All right. So you guys have seen the book. And now I'm going to show you this ribbon. It is weird. All right, settings, present. All right, now I got it. Present, and it's telling me to share screen. So that's what I'm going to do. As soon as I get this thing where I can see it. Yeah. I don't know how you do it, Martin. All I don't know how you do it, Martin. All that sharing the screen you do, man, this just slows me. This slows my narrative down. Totally slows me down trying to do all this. Yeah, guys, you are not going to see pictures in this one. There is no way I'm going to sit here for 15 hours. Yeah, StreamYard doesn't make it easy. So I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up and show you the pictures out the damn book. That's what I'm going to do. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous how, how hard that is. All right. So let me get rid of that. I do have another video to show you. All right. Let's get on with this presentation before I... I'm just going to get up and show you show you the pictures. It's going to be so much easier and faster. So, William Corliss. We're going to start with a very unusual, unusual account of ball lightning. You got to remember, guys, ball lightning is what the scientific community calls it. It's up to, it's up to you to decide what it really is. So, on August 15th, 1975, Miss MacArthur witnessed an incredible species of ball lightning outside her home in Ar Argyllshire, Scotland. 
The shape of the lightning, especially the tail, is the critical element in this observation. She said, I call it a bulb of lightning. It was opaque. It may or may not have been lit inside. It would be nine inches in length, slim, dome-shaped. I saw it above my chair as the fire as the fire came out in front of the kitchen window. But it didn't touch the ground. Strangely, it hovered. This isn't acting like lightning. So uh, she goes on, she goes on to say that hovered in the ground and it started undulating it started it started doing different stuff and the story was so unusual and the witnesses verified that it was re- that it was reported in the journal of meteorology for the UK in 1976 this is what she saw does that look like ball lightning to you does that look like ball lightning to you that is weird. It looks nothing like ball lightning. So we have scientists who can't ignore something that's been that's been that's that's been reported like this. So they call it something that it clearly isn't, and they do this over and over and over. So it's a there have been there have been uh in this book, William Cordes goes on to detail several instances where the scientists called things ball lightning when a ball of fire just appeared over a forest and didn't burn anything, but it sounded like a train. And everybody was looking around thinking that there was a locomotive nearby. People were perplexing. There's no there's no railroad tracks anywhere, and yet this ball of fire appears and it's the source of the noise but it doesn't burn anything up and it travels 10 feet above the ground horizontal. It's not falling out of the sky. It's traveling straight over, over the deal. Guys, this book should be available in PDF form. If it's not, if, if it's not, I can't do it. It would be a violation of copyright. This book is from 1976. It has to be 70 years old before it can be, can be liberated of copyright. I'm really sure that you can find a copy of this book. Those of you who are real serious in your education, I know that you're going to want this book, Handbook of Unusual Natural Phenomena, because I'm only going to be able to gloss over some of these some of these amazing things in there. It's going to get more and more perplexing as we go. So the uh uh let me let me see the 20, let me go see what, what that was. Yeah, that was 1872, November 30th. Uh, TLM Cartwright of Banbury, England was the one that recorded this and several people came out to look and his gardeners were perplexed and they saw this flaming ball come over the forest and then hover 10 foot above the ground moving at a velocity that allowed them to watch it for several minutes before it disappeared. It didn't burn anything up. Then uh, it veered back at 6 foot above the ground to 10 foot. It was moving up and down. So when it came back, it was a, there was a blast of wind that accompanied it. So uh, that is just so strange. When it came back, the ball was attended by a sulfurous odor and ultimately seemed to vanish without a sound as soon as it upro- uprooted several very large trees bodily out of the ground. That. How do you process something like that? How do you, how do you see something like that? And then it's acting with intelligence, whatever it is. And then it just detonates and blows all these trees out of the ground and then just dissipates and disappears. How do you process something like that? I'm going to tell you how scientists do. They call it ball lightning. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one, guys, because we got some, we got some ground to cover. Good thing I marked all these page numbers or we'd have been lost. So, F. Ramsbotham, Sussex, England. For some years, he had been studying a phenomenon, and uh, the locals just call it the Will O' Wisps. The scientists named it Ignis Fatus. But these Will O' Wisps keep keep reappearing at different times and what this man noticed in 1891 that there was a pattern he studied this he made it his life passion and he found out 
something they act with intelligence but very interestingly these will o wisps are yellow glowing spheres of different sizes that move through the trees they appear right before bad thunderstorms during bad thunderstorms and right after bad thunderstorms right after inclement weather and stuff so this is another piece of the puzzle what's going on here it's a piece of the puzzle. This is These are not independent phenomena, guys. You got to understand, we're going to build a cohesion through this, through this video. We're going somewhere with all this. So uh, on page 71, William Cordes discusses the Esperanza light. Now, I don't really have to go. I, I know all this. I know all this material. The Esperanza light is really interesting because that's LaSalle County, Texas, right here where I'm at. And, uh, this is another will-o'-wisp, and it's been there for many years. It's been documented by many locals. It's been studied by many people. It is considered scientific fact that this, this Esperanza light appears. It, too, is a globe. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a yellow glowing orb. It passes through the trees. It's been seen by, by tourists. It's been seen by locals. It's called the Esperanza light in LaSalle County, Texas. And other than that, there's just not a whole lot more to add to it. It's just in LaSalle County. It is a it is a subject of, of knowledge among all the locals. They'll tell you all about it. And it's something that reappears and it always keeps reappearing right when people uh, least expect to see it. So it, it seems to be evasive and it acts with intelligence. It's no different than the many versions of the Esperanza light that have been found in North Carolina in the Brown Mountains. In fact, they're called the Brown Mountain lights and they've been seen many times by many people over many, over many years. And they're, 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 it's said to be, they're said to be very beautiful. And sometimes there's many of them in a line and they seem to be dancing with each other and they, they disappear and reappear. And they're often seen from two to six minutes at a time. So again, we have these, we have these, these orbs, these things that are just go, are they're basically phasing in and out of our awareness or they're phasing in and out of our reality, this construct that we are in. And it is a construct because that's another element of this video where we're going with all this. What William Corliss's conclusion is concerning all of this data is completely against the scientific narrative which is another reason I love this man, Charles Fort and, and William Corliss. I got a bromance for both these guys. So the reason I just wanted to introduce this topic with the Will-O-Wisps, which were also called Foo Fighters in World War I when World War II, it was a documented phenomenon that pilots right before, right, I mean, right before battles, right before things got violent, before anti, uh, uh, anti-aircraft flak started, they saw foo, they saw what they called foo fighters. The word foo fighter is, de is deliberately said that way to detract from what's really going on. Scientific community wants you to think that there's ghost planes up there. It makes you, you know, dismiss things being for being ridiculous. But that's not what the pilots reported. The pilots reported glowing orbs in the sky that could take on different shapes that actually dogfight with them, that flew along uh, uh, with them and then took off at great speeds. They they realized they were not alone in the skies in World War One and World War Two. These were dubbed by naval intelligence as being because this is before the Air Force was, was, was existed, but naval intelligence had had dubbed them Foo Fighters. But uh, some of these Foo Fighters even even pop up in a uh, 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 what is it? Totally lost my, totally lost my train of thought. I was reading the chat at the same time about saying, saying almost fire, but, uh, yeah, these foo, these foo fighters, they even pop up on radar. They have been seen on radar. Not all of them, but there have been indicate there have been times, even in modern times, the U S military has dispatched jets to go investigate radar blips that were too consistent at, with, with an object that was out there. And then when they actually got there and, and they got a visual on what it was, it was a foo fighter. It was another orb and it took off at great speed and, and it, it's gone and there's no way our technology could follow it. So we're going to go, we're going somewhere with all this because what, what I'm going to reveal in this video is going to shock you about what's going on. Remember guys, these, these things have been seen in the Bermuda triangle before ships had vanished. Like the Mary Celeste, Mary Celeste was what well, was found intact with food at the table. Every single human occupant gone, all the rowboats were intact. They had not been used. 
but that's not, that's only the most famous one, the Mary Celeste, I believe it was 1872 or something like that. But derelict ships have been found for thousands of years, every human gone, no evidence of piracy, things that are very valuable still intact across the ship. So this is something that's gone on for a very long period of time. Now, we're going to get to tornadoes. I had to introduce the Foo Fighters, St. Elmo's Fire, Will-O-Wisp, Ghost Lights, Ball Lightning Scientific Explanations, because we're going to go into phenomena now that should not have these same participants, but they do. Let's go into tornadoes with unusual lights, shafts of light inside tornado funnels and glowing clouds in the sky that feed tornadoes with light. It's very interesting. Let's go to page 31 and see what Mr. Cordes has to, has to start this, this discussion out with. So we have, I'm going to show, and I'm going to show you this picture here in a second because it's very unusual, but, uh, during a powerful thunderstorm in France in 1879, a whole forest was lit up with, with, with uh, some type of corona discharge. Scientists called it a brush discharge. The sun was hidden and the, and the country covered with thick darkness. At this moment, the pine forest around St. Saint, Sergeway, Saint I guess it's Sergeway, was suddenly illuminated and shone with a light bearing a striking resemblance to the, to the phosphorescence of the sea, as in the tropics. The light disappeared with every clap of thunder, only to reappear with increased intensity until the subsidence of the tempest. This was published on page 622 of, of the English Mechanic, 1879. Can you imagine a thunderstorm rolling in? And underneath the thunderstorm, no rain has fallen. There's no lightning visible at all. But you can hear thunder in the clouds, and yet the forest is glowing blue. When the light, then when the lightning does strike, the blue forest gets brighter, and then the thunder rolls. As the thunder rolls, all the blue light disappears, and the entire forest is cast into blackness. Whole sky is dark as the thunder rolls. When the thunder stops rolling, the blue light that's illuminating the forest under the clouds returns a little bit brighter. And after a few moments, more lightning strikes. When the lightning strikes, the forest glows even more blue. And then the thunder follows. When the thunder follows, the blue light vanishes in the, in the, forest, in the forest is returned to utter blackness. Can you imagine a storm that lasted 40, 40 minutes to an hour, and this is what you saw the whole time? That is unusual. So we go to 34, we'll keep going in. So again, the same phenomenon was recorded in 1949 at Yellowstone Park in Wyoming by a William B. Uh, Sand Sandborn when he had noticed that there was a violent thunderstorm with a lot of lightning several miles away. But, uh, but above him, it was just blue skies. It was all nice. I mean, excuse me, it was all. The sky was full of stars. It was all nice. However, the landscape all around him glowed with a blue luminosity, and it was reacting to the thunderstorm far away. That's pretty interesting. This, this is very interesting. Remember, guys, I'm a simulationist. I find, I find a lot of interest in this because simulation implies technology. Technology implies power sources. Power source requ re implies there's going to be some type of electrical involvement. There's going to be some type of plasma involvement. Uh, these things are not mysterious to me. What is mysterious, though, are these little participants we're going to get back to here in a minute that keep up popping up during all, all this phenomena. These little tricksters. So this guy stood there for a while as the thunderstorm got closer and closer and 
closer. And as it did, the landscape got bluer and bluer. And then when the thunder, when the thunderstorm passed over his area, if he, he, he describes it as like a blue light fog that enveloped him. That's pretty interesting. I have never experienced anything like that. But here we have, uh, this is in Natural History, pay, uh, Natural History, Volume 59, page 258, 1950. Uh, I, find that, I find that intriguing as well, these, these luminosities. So, William Cordes goes on, goes on to assert that lightning and thunderstorms are always nearby when this phenomenon occurs. Likewise, this phenomenon is also attended with strange light bubbles that are seen in the air that are of a different color. Many times, scientists have written these off as ball lightning and will-o'-wisps. So William Cordes is admitting to... Uh, a whole collection of scientific reports about this blue phenomenon that appears near proximity or during thunderstorms, but also that these same orbs, these will-o'-wisps, these things they like to call ball lightning, are also seen dancing in and out of these fogs and stuff. So William Cordes, William Cordes doesn't speculate as to what they are. He's only documenting that they're very, they're very well documented and ignored. So the very fact scientists can call them ball lightning basically means they can write it off and not draw attention to it. So you really never hear about the, these, these instances. So we're going to move. Oh, yeah. He provides an illustration that's pretty interesting. Um, this happened in Ringstead Bay, England. A whole bunch of people went outside and they could see these little these, these little yellow bubbles hot, just in the air. And they went outside and played with them and they reacted to them and they acted with intelligence. Yeah, guys, these are your Foo Fighters. They can take on different sizes, different shapes. And as you'll see here in a minute, they can do all kinds of things. Now, remember, in the past, I've showed you guys actual photos in some of my videos of the work of Trevor James Constable. Remember, Trevor James Constable developed an ultraviolet lens attached to his camera where he could photograph the sky in multiple dimensions, and he could actually photograph. He's, his photographs are fantastic but he photographs these spheres and these blobs that can change shape that are in the sky. And when they, when they, when he starts photographing, they instantly know they're being observed and they change shape or they fade away. They dissipate or they just fly off real fast. But before, but, but before that happens, he can always get a few shots in and he, He's done this thousands of times, and his book is fantastic. He's got two books, uh, but the book that, that it's in my library by Trevor James Constable is fantastic. It is absolutely packed full of photographs of these things that are seen in the sky that cannot be seen with the naked eye, or they cannot be seen unless they want to be seen. So, so that there's some crossover with what's being documented here and the research of Trevor James Constable which I've always found fascinating. So let's go to an earthquake in Japan. Yeah, 1931. Japanese earthquake was especially violent and generated many observations of earthquake lights. With this earthquake, the lights were usually described as beams radiating from a point on the horizon as like lightning or a searchlight turned into the sky and they were blue or bluish in color. Guys, right before and during the earthquake, this is what people saw. These are like blue lasers. This is what they saw. That doesn't even make sense from a scientific perspective. The horizon line is issuing these while the earthquake 
is afflicting Japan. That, that is just pure weird. It's just pure weird. But there's other pictures in here showing the bands across the sky. There's pictures in here showing what scientists have documented. It's glowing phosphorus or photophosphoric bands of light that cross the entire sky from north to south. Like ribs across the sky. And they're all equidistant from each other. But during an earthquake, they were actually seen. That's interesting. That was in Japan, 1931. And in 1930, uh, no, in Cyprus, in 1941, an earthquake on Cyprus, a bright flash associated with the earthquake was seen from the eastern and central parts of the island. And after the quake itself, a Nicosia Haja standing on a minaret for morning prayer looked and saw a brilliant reddish object like a huge globular lightning ball moving slowly toward the east. There is a strong evidence that the direction of the flash was pointing to the epicentral area of the earthquake. What? What's being said here is that in is that a bright flash occurred in the sky and an earthquake afflicted Cyprus. But the area of the earthquake, the, cent the epicentral area of the earthquake, was pointed out by a flash of light that came from a glowing red blob in the sky that was seen by a guy at a high altitude. He was on a minaret. He was at the top of a minaret doing a morning prayer. That's just weird. That's just weird. Now, energy or plasma halos are were, were seen by many people when a volcano did right before a volcano started detonating. When it was when it was venting, they could see energy halos. I'm just showing that because it's right here on this page. I haven't gotten to volcanoes yet. So a farmer. Living in Greenberg, Kansas, June 22nd, 1928, had the rare privi privilege of looking right into a tornado funnel while standing at the entrance of the cyclone cellar. This story is fantastic, and this story is in several other books. Listen, guys, this guy lives in Tornado Alley, and he's got a cellar that goes real deep in a, in a, in a ladder and a tunnel that goes down, down into a cellar. His family... His family were scooped up off the farm. He got everybody together, put him in the cellar. He's the last one going down, and he's about to close the hatch as the tornado comes toward, it, toward his farm. He do doesn't close the hatch fast enough, but he's in no danger because he's underground. The tornadoes suck from the sides. They don't suck you out of the ground. So when the tornado passes over directly the, set, the entrance to the tun cellar tunnel, He's looking up at, at the tornado, and he can't believe. He's looking at yellow glowing orbs inside the tornado. He doesn't have, I mean, how, how is he supposed to process that? He didn't, access, he didn't have access to William Cordes' data. He doesn't know what's going on. He's just looking at the inside of a tornado, thinking that it's going to be all kinds of hell, but instead it was very peaceful. He says that in his testimony. All the noise stopped. On the outside of the tornado funnel, it was dark. It was scary. It was windy. It sounded like a roaring train. But once it passed over him, it was silent. It was peaceful. And the inside of the funnel, the inside of the tornado funnel, had glowing yellow orbs. So, it's not an isolated incident. That was 1928. We have almost the exact same thing happening again in 1955. Now we have illustration to show you. 1955, May 25th, Blackwell, Oklahoma. Lee Hunter saw a light column effect vividly appear inside the funnel from the cloud to the ground of a tornado connected to the clouds above. 
It was a steady, deep blue light, but it was very bright. Inside the funnel was an orange color. Get this, guys. This is crazy. He, they provide, this is in the Journal of Meteorology for 1957. And in the journal, which is a scientific journal, it shows this illustration of what's being described. A light inside the funnel. But way up here in the sky, feeding the, feeding the tornado, is a bluish, a bluish cloud. A cloud glows blue, feeding the tornado. But inside the tornado funnel, it's yellow light. Yeah, guys, this is insane. And I'm going to tell you right now, you would never be hearing this from uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye the Science Guy. Neither one of these guys are going to be talking about this stuff. So... That was 1955. So we're going to page 41. Oh, 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 get this. Here, here. This is even better. The exact same storm was observed from miles away by somebody else. And they have a picture of what this individual saw. This is the same storm, May 25th, 1955. But Herbert L. Jones was observing from a distance, and this is what he saw at Blackwell, Oklahoma. This other guy saw it from the inside. This guy saw it from a great distance, and this is what he saw. This guy didn't even, this guy didn't even know a tornado had happened. He was looking at the clouds and saw that there's a great, great mass of blue inside the thunderstorm as it was building and developing. So he was watching it before the tornado actually appeared. There's the big mass of blue he saw. It was very unusual. He reported it. So the scientific community, they got, they got multiple reports of all this, but the two that they documented were the ones that they comported with one another, and they drew these illustrations. It's very, I mean, the whole thing is just so, it's so bizarre. How come we've never heard about these things? How come, how come we've never heard that Foo Fighters and Willow Whips are on the inside of tornadoes and thunderstorms? How did that happen? And here it is, the same pulse. Remember the first, the first one I told you guys about where the full, every time the thunder rolled, all the blue, all the blue in the glowing force, it's like a blue fog. It, di it died, and it was pitch black forest. And when the thunder stopped, the thunderstorm continued. But when the thunder, when the thunderclap had stopped, stopped vibrating, the blue returned slightly brighter. And then lightning flashed, the blue got brighter. And then when the thunder started rolling two or three seconds later, the blue vanished. This is so bizarre. But it's exactly what this guy observing this cloud saw too. He said it was two second pulses. The blue illumination would be in the cloud and then for two seconds it would disappear only to return again two seconds later to last for two seconds and it maintained this cycle for a long time. What this is this is this is is bizarre. It's just bizarre. So let's move on. A lot of ground to cover. Okay, these thunderstorms what we're going to go into now is shadow graphs. Let me explain what a shadow graph is. It's very important that we also is isolate this phenomena because it shows that lightning and thunder isn't what we think it is, that something else is going on, and that the scientific community has normalized thunderstorm activity. And we just think it's, an a it's, a, it's a natural part of our world. But is it? Is it induced? Is something causing it? Because I'm going to tell you now, way before we became technologically advanced in this la in this reset period, you know, right here in 2023, we have testimony from the 1800s and 1700s of all these all these strange, bizarre, highly localized storms. Remember, guys, I have a very good video that gives many examples of Phoenix phenomenon type storms that happened only over a certain community and no other communities comported. Although the destruction was there, eyewitness testimony was there, people were affected, structures and buildings and animals were affected. 
No other communities that were within eyesight comported that as if a little insular bubble of reality was created just for that cataclysm to happen. And that little bubble, bubble of a community and the rest of the world would, would think they're crazy. Ah, you're out of your mind. That didn't happen. But we have way too many documented incidents of this. Now, shadow graphs are when lightning has struck very close to somebody or living organisms and the shadow of the living organism is imprinted on local objects. This has happened, guys. I know many of you have never heard of this. Shadow graphs, shadow graphs are real and they have been documented. So here's a, here's a couple examples. 1904. This happened in 1904. I, I think I got three examples. This this so baffled people. This right here was just this right here was just amazing. I'm going to show you the picture. 1904 in the North Atlantic above above the the uh, Hamburg America liner of Galicia. Yeah, Gal Galicia. Lightning struck a cabin. This is so bizarre. This was actually published in Scientific American, 1904. Lightning, lightning struck a cabin with a man, and a man was inside the cabin of this liner. When he moved his his hand was on a dresser. When he moved his hand, there was a shadow of his hand. Even the even the hairs on his on his arm, everything was perfectly preserved in shadow form on the dresser when when lightning struck very very close close to him, but it hit his cabin. This is this is the effect. This is the effect right here. You can see his hand on the dresser. When he pulled his hand away, his hand was on was right there. Now remember, guys, we have an electrostatic field. We have a field that contains information. It contains it contains a, 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 a re, it, this field actually regulates the body. It's not the other way around. The body doesn't regulate the field. The field regulates the body. When when the avatar dies, the field go, moves on. Something happened here, and he got supercharged. But not just him, not just him. We have another one right here. Oh. Uh, 1851. Thomas Logan was an eyewitness to a very very uh, unusual event in Washington County, Maryland. Yeah, this is so so bizarre here, right here too. It's also published in Scientific American, 1869. This man was looking through a window during a thunderstorm, and he was looking at goats on the ground, and there was a robin in a tree hiding from the rain. In the the rot, and it started thunderstorming. Lightning, lightning hit hit the top of the tree, killed all, all the goats, killed the robin. When the storm was over, the guy went out there and looked out there, out there at what happened when the lightning struck. And the robin was dead, the goats were dead, but a perfect, a perfect image of the robin, even individual feathers that were kind of off of it, a perfect image of the ro robin was shadow graphed to where he could see it like, wow, when the robin was alive. Not only that, but but uh, uh, the shadows of goats, all this stuff. She, I'm sorry, I said goats, it was sheep. It was sheep. But the most amazing shadow graph testimony in this book, there's several of them, but the most amazing one was four boys Four boys were hiding from a rainstorm that turned into a thunderstorm under a tree, and the tree got hit by lightning. Three of the boys looked at looked at one of the others in shock and horror, and they're staring at this because his entire face and body, I guess he didn't have a shirt on, but his entire face and body looked like tree, looked like tree limbs and leaves perfectly. They had been, the lightning had shadow graphed all the detail on his skin. So they, they all go, go to their homes and stuff and come to find out that the shadow graph 
roofing went through the clothes of the other boys as, as well. And they had pieces of, sh of shadows that were of leaves and limbs on their bodies as well. That's crazy. That's crazy. It's showing. Look, I'm giving you these examples to show you. Look, science do, does not have the answers for everything. And and if the constitution of our world is fundamentally different than what we've been told, which I believe it is, I believe this is this is a this is a simulated this is a simulated environment, and uh, that that means this is technological, which means electricity plays a much greater part. This isn't a natural environment at all at all. Everything is simulated to be like a natural environment. And in that natural environment, if it really was a planet and all that, then some of these things may be true. Some of these physics constants, some of these, some of these phenomena, but it's not true here. Everything here is falsified. So let's go with, uh, Yeah, that lightning is so strange. So, after the shadow graphing, he goes on to explain that lightning lightning has some very unusual properties. But another incident, another inc incident comes absolutely from the year 1902, Phoenix year, and it's just it's just, lightning struck a house in Iowa in 1902, and in the house were thousands of dishes and china and all kinds of stuff. None of it got cracked or broken. None of it. None. I mean, excuse me. None of it got cracked or broken. Broken. Uh, uh, but it was all thrown in disarray around the house, which was very unusual because, like, damn, all the stuff that got to move like that it should have shattered, should have broke, didn't, but it didn't. But when they opened the cabinets, there were stacks of plates. Every other plate had shattered. But every other plate was perfectly intact. Yeah, the scientific community documented that one too. They couldn't explain it at all. I can't explain it. I can't explain it. But, but uh, that's all. That's very discriminating to shatter every other plate in 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 the stacks, but to leave every other plate perfectly intact. That's just that's very discriminating. Maybe there is a scientific explanation. I don't know. But William Cordes doesn't know it either. So I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly uh, justified in giving that example in this video. Here's another example. On January 5th, 1890, lightning struck a kitchen. Now, also the dishes, the dish, the dishware and glassware was all intact. No problems, but there were eggs being stored in that kitchen and every single eggshell fractured like glass, but the fracturing did not disturb the membranes. Not one egg cracked and leaked out. In fact, in the article, it specifically says the eggs were later cooked and they were just fine. That was lightning. In 1873, this is a weird, this is a weird one here. Again, it tells us lightning is something unusual. This is in the English Mechanic, page 214, 1878. It happened in Vernon, France. Lightning struck the ground in Vernon, France, and people went out to go look at the area, and they saw the area slightly burned. Lightning had hit it. It had killed all the vegetation within two or three feet of the lightning strike. But two or three weeks later, the circle of death had gotten bigger and more plants had died, leaving nothing but dirt. Months later, the circle of death got even bigger and more and more bushes and plants were dead. Six months, six months later, the circle of death had widened. It just kept getting bigger and bigger. That whole area of the ground was dying. It's just so, that's so bizarre. It says it increased year by year. Every year it increased. Wow. And it, 
it, it was a small area, but it just increased bigger and bigger and bigger. The death all the way out to seven meters, like 20 feet, a little over 20 feet. So it went out 20 feet and even killed a cherry tree planted 12 years before. It, it shriveled up and died just like the, just like the rest. Some type of fatal, fatal flora killing lightning. That's just so bizarre. Maybe it dropped a th poisonous thunderstone. I don't know. You guys know about thunderstones? They were real popular. They reported them in the 16th, 16th century, 17th century, 18th, 18th century, the, the 1800s. Thunderstones, thunder, thunder, thunderstones are mentioned by William Cordes. He talks about them in here, but he doesn't go into a lot of detail. But scientists hate, hate the topic of thunderstones. They'll try to say you're a moron and all that. But it has been conclusively shown. Many times during thunderstorms, when lightning hits an area and you feel a thud, it's not just light. There's a rock in there. Go, go. All you got to do is just dig in that area and you're going to come across an unusual melted looking rock. Sometimes they've called them tectites and all that. Thunderstones, they've made weapons out of thunderstones. Thunderstones were actually sought for. And yeah, it's, uh, it's so crazy. Whole thing's just so crazy. And one thing the scientific community does not want to bridge is meteorite or meteoritic phenomena and thunderstorms. They don't want to admit that there's a correlate between meteorites and thunderstorms. But in all the legends and traditions of old, there is a correlate. Because often when storms happened in the ancient world, rocks fell out of heaven too. And they did away with enemies or farms and cities and all that. So yeah, it's a, sometimes, it was, sometimes it was sulfur. And we have incidents in this book of thunderstorms stinking like putrid sulfur. What the hell is that? What the hell is up in the sky that would stink like that? But we'll get to that in a minute because we got some really weird stuff we're about to report here. I have no idea how I am on time. But then again, I'm going to get this. If it's going to be long, it's just going to be long. Simple as that. Because we got to get through it. So here's a real weird one. Super weird. Manchester, England, 1949. Right here in this book on page 176. These people go outside because they hear a thunderstorm. When they go outside, they look and it's a miniature thunderstorm. The clouds are miniature. The lightning is miniature. Even the sound of thunder is very close. It's very local. They look and they know it's not far away. It's right there in their local sky. And it's a real small thunderstorm, a full-fledged thunder and lightning storm going off. But it's tiny and it's just suspended right there in the sky. That would freak me out. That was in 1949. I'm going to go see one page 176, see if I missed anything on that one. That was, that's just, that's just plain weird. A whole thunderstorm, guys, not even 100 yards long, meaning it's less than 300 feet long, and the cloud thickness was six feet. It was dark on the bottom. Lightning raced, raced uh, back and forth along the, uh, the, the clouds, and the thunder discharge was like field artillery. And the whole thunderstorm lasted four minutes. Can you imagine seeing a miniature football field length thunderstorm in full effect with lightning and thunder and rain and all that? And it's just local and it's right there and it's so small. Yeah, that would be highly bizarre. Highly bizarre. But remember, guys, these are scientific records right here. They just don't, they just don't publicize this stuff to the public. You got to go to the specialist literature like like Charles Fort did and like William Cordes did and like my buddy John Keel here. I don't know where his book is. It's in here somewhere because we're going to do, we have to do a video on him too because the, the stuff in this book is fantastic. John Keel, Our Haunted Planet. He talks about a lot of this stuff too. This is, this is Our Haunted Planet by John Keel. You got a video coming on that one. So yeah, it's just so bizarre, so bizarre. But yeah, you have to understand 
Remember, guys, I'm a simulationist. And as a simulationist, I can understand that everything is coding. And because everything is coding, that implies technology. And I understand that technology implies implies fallibility, meaning that technology that, that programming requires a programmer. And programmers are not gods. That we have a situation where where coding protocols could get mixed up. This is why we have resets and we have reboots and we have edits. This is why I have provided videos showing you historical examples of when the sky sim failed and the sky wasn't there. People saw what was really there and it baffled them. And we're going to get into that here too. We're going to get into the machinery of our existence here in a little while. So let's move on. We don't want, so, uh, In 1931, there was a there's a scientific report of a cloud all by itself in the sky producing machine-like uh, noises and thunders and booms and whizzing sounds, and it was just really bizarre. It was documented. It was 1931. It's noisy clouds. But uh, he goes into a lot of depth on pages 188 and 189. I'm not going to give you all the different examples, but on pages 188 and 189, he goes into a lot of depth on rain falling from clear blue skies people being baffled just looking up like where's all this rain coming from yeah daytime clear blue sky not a cloud in sight no wind and it's just raining so we're not talking about isolated incidents guys we're talking about whole streams of very well documented places when and it's happened all over the world so um and here's another one so bizarre so bizarre i got to show you this picture I gotta show you this picture because it's just bizarre. How do you even process something like this? All this hail. Weird hail. What sucks is I have all these images right here. I'm gonna just I'm gonna, at the end of the video, I'm gonna share all these videos. I'm gonna share all these little images. Let's see. Hmm. So imagine hail that falls with different shapes, geometrical shapes. How does that happen? How does that happen? Is there like a giant cookie cutter in the sky that has all these little shapes and fill, let's go ahead and fill it with water. Go ahead and freeze it, flash freeze it. All right. All right. Drop the bottom. All the hail just falls. How else was it possible for geometrical shapes to fall in the form of ice hail but that's what we have and it's been documented many times what i'm not getting is why it's so hard for me to find something that I just, i've seen so many times in this book there they are so bizarre so i'm going to get up and show you guys this because this just doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense from a scientific perspective. It makes a lot of sense if we're in a simulated environment and sometimes coding gets mixed up. Sometimes you just have weird protocols going on because we do have generative protocols where new life forms are introduced from the sky. I have whole videos about that. Remember my video on the insect plagues of the 1800s? Yeah, whole rivers of new insects fell straight out of the sky, multiple locations in this world. So let's look at this. This is hail. Imagine hundreds of thousands of these things falling out the sky, solid ice. This is hail. How did that happen? It looks like Saturn. That's hail. It's not the only one. This is hail too. Geometrical forms, almost perfect. That's hailstones, solid ice. Got to be a giant cookie cutter in the sky. Wait a minute. What's this? It looks like a compass. The same imprint is found in all this hail. All the, all the hail crystals are different. But not the compass part. It's the same on all the pieces. Is there a cookie cutter in the sky that makes hailstones? at this doesn't even make any sense so look at this these are hailstones guys they don't make sense does not make sense hailstones like starfish 
What is going on? Solid ice. Hailstones looking just like this. How did that happen? Yeah, how did, it's just weird. Just so weird. All right, so I will have to say this too. Imagine, imagine a hailstone, and when you look at it, it's got a frozen turtle in it. There you go. That's hail. A frozen turtle in the sky. Imagine that. So, for those of you who have been following my channel for a good length of time, a frozen turtle falling from the sky is not mysterious. We already have all that. As a matter of fact, on pages 237 to 244, right here in this book, he, go, he gives so many examples that I'm not going to reiterate them here. Examples all around the world of falling fish of different sizes, frogs, toads, snails, shellfish, worms, caterpillars, snakes. Guys, in my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, published in 2011, in the very back, I have a chapter called Shards of Nibiru. And in that chapter, I, I basically itemize probably 30 to 40 different times that insect pupa insects and different snails and different life forms rained from the sky and were preserved in snow and ice yeah guys this has been going on for a very long period of time there are repositories in the sky that drop life forms on us now he goes into great depth here too and i'm going to read a passage out of this book because he smashes the scientific explanations of of typhoon or a cyclone a whirlwind a, a water spout a tornado suck these things up and then deposited them down this is the same thing that that meteorologists try to tell you every time cosmic dust begins to blanket our world they tell you that hey there's an air advisory out you have dust from the Sahara Desert uh, passing over North America, dust from the Sahara Desert passing over China. Hey, y'all, y'all, and, and now sometimes they'll tell China it's Gobi. Yeah, they use whatever deserts are local or local to that area, but it's always the same thing. They're always telling you that dust kicked up from different deserts are the reason why these hazes exist. It's not true. And I, I addressed this multiple times in my published books and on my channel. Even Charles Fort knew it was bullshit. He even mentioned that far back in 1920s that science likes to likes to explain that these dusts come from local deserts. He knew it was untrue. William Corliss knows it's bullshit too. And when you see it on the six o'clock news tonight, remember Jason told you all that haze and, and, and dust isn't coming from deserts, but that, that's what the news media is going to tell you. It's coming from the sky. So now, so oh, I'm, it's not only on two, on pages 252 and 253, he goes on and explains that it's not just insects reptiles and amphibians that fall from the sky he cites reports of when people went outside and it was raining seeds it was raining nuts or berries doesn't even make any sense sometimes it was blue skies so what we're having what, what, what we have here are Here's more evidence of, of other videos that I have done that these vast repositories in the sky dump things on us routinely, sometimes to perpetuate life on Earth, sometimes to correct a programming problem. My video on insect plagues of the 1800s, I'm, I'm, my whole theory about what happened was that the construct wasn't aware that there were no more insects in, in Britain, England. In Corland, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, that all the all the beetles and roaches and dragonflies and wasps and bees and ants, everything had disappeared. And it was, and once it was recognized by the collective in the in that area of the world, the construct overcompensated and sent rivers of insects all over the place. And it wasn't the first time this has happened. Now we're seeing more evidence of this of this phenomena at work. It's very unusual. 
just like the great black death plague of 1347 that killed one third of the world's population. Your scientists and historians today are lying to you. They tell you that, that infected rats from China arriving by ship into the Mediterranean and Europe infected the port cities first and the bubonic plague spread spread out from there that is not what the what the historians of the 14th century tell us they tell us that they specifically saw gigantic cigar shaped apparitions in the sky opening their bellies and dead decomposed in putrid sulfurous smelling animal body parts reigned over the forest and this is why deep in the interior of europe the bubonic plague was the worst yeah guys historians historians and scientists are the worst all they do is a parrot what they've been told they're not real true researchers today so Oh, uh, okay. Noisy clouds. Okay. I have to read this because it is so genius. What William Corliss says about falling fish, falling frogs, toads, snails, shellfish, worms, caterpillars, snakes, uh, even seeds, nuts, berries, all these life forms that fall out of the sky that science tries to dismiss as water spouts suck them up and then deposited them somewhere. This man is my hero. We're going to read what he said about that because it smashes all that. Watch this. This is all, listen to this. All right. Uh, page 237. Okay. Listen to this guys, because this completely blows the sciences out the water on their stupid explanations. To begin, there exist many well-documented fish, frog, and animal falls. No one seriously denies that they do take place now. The stranger aspects of these falls appear only after reviewing many reports. First, the transporting mechanism, whatever it may be, tends to select only a single species of fish or frog or whatever animal is on the menu for that day. Second, size selection is also carefully controlled in many instances. Third, no debris such as sand or plant material is dropped along with the animals. Fourth, even though saltwater species are dropped, there are no records of the accompanying rainfalls being salty. All in all, the mechanism involved is rather fastidious in what it transports. The water spout or whirlwind theory is easiest to swallow when the fish that fall, the, when the fish that fall are all of the same species, but this is not what we find. Do you see the gravity? Do you hear the gravity of what he's saying? None of those scientific explanations can apply because it's not fish of different sizes and different species. It's the same fish and the same size that falls. Snails, arachnids, the insects, the, the lizards and snakes and turtles. It's always the same. When they rain in any area of the world, it's as if, they're all grown in some, some, some vast reservoir hidden in the sky. They're all grown to a certain, a certain size and age. It's all one species, and then they're dumped. Then they're dumped. Yeah, guys, no water spout, no tornado would ever be so discriminating. This is, this is basically what he's saying. He's calling bullshit on all the scientific explanations. Let's see. So, oh, we're, we still got some amazing shit to cover, guys. So, here's another one. I, I'm going to have to read something else because it just, it's, these are two old poems about star jelly. What? Never heard about star jelly, have you? Well, I've talked about it before on my channel, but I didn't call it star jelly. I found out only in this book that star jelly is a description that goes back centuries. I didn't know that. I got my information from Charles, Charles Hoy Fort, when he has an entire chapter dedicated to showing that 
Many people have gone to the impact site of meteorites, what you call falling stars, this, this bright flash across the sky. When they, when they land locally, many people have gone to investigate them and were very distressed to find that it wasn't rock that fell from the sky. Those shooting stars are made of a clear gelatinous material that stinks to high heaven like putrid sulfur. This has been found so many thousands of times that it's not even denied. Now, I got to, this is so crazy. 254. Yeah, Charles Ford spends a lot of time talking about these. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I just want those of you who plan on ordering this book, trying to find this book, this is a, you're going to read so much in here. It's going to blow your mind. But a lot of times these things come out of blood colored clouds. What? Lone clouds out, out by themselves, blood color, colored shoot something that we think is a, is a, is a shooting star. And a lot of times these blood colored clouds are hidden at nighttime. We can't see them in, in the dark. Yeah. But they shoot these things. It's a, that's a, that's a, we believe it's a shooting star it goes across the sky, go to, go to that area. And you got this gelatin, all this, this stinking gelatin all over the area that as soon as the sun comes up, it vaporize, it, it, it literally evaporates and there's no evidence it was there. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Gel gelatinous meteors. Wow. Called Pedrasir. Star jelly is still another name for Pedrasir. But nothing can be as descriptive as rot of the stars. Yeah, star rot. This is crazy. Now. The basic phenomenon has been the same since written history began. A meteor is seen to land nearby. Investigation reveals a jelly-like mass in the approximate location. Thus, we have star jelly, or more sci scientifically, it is referred to is as a gelatinous How come you don't hear? How come? Neat thing about that. I don't know if I faded out for a second. Listen, how come Bill Nye the Science Guy and Neil deGrasse Tyson aren't educating you about that? Star jelly. Yeah. What can we do with star jelly? It only lasts till morning. I remember a story from the Bible where the Israelites were hungry. They needed something to eat, and manna fell out of heaven. And the one thing they couldn't do is leave that man on the ground because it would dissipate, it would disappear, it would evaporate. Let's see. It's just so bizarre. So, this man, this man, William Corliss, in Handbook of Unusual and Natural Phenomena, Eyewitness Accounts of Nature's Greatest Mysteries, he cites two old poems. We need to pay attention to this because it shows that this isn't something that just started happening. This has been happening before the Industrial Age, guys. This is, this is uh, 1541. A, this is an author named Suckling. In 1541, he wrote this. As he whose quicker eye doth trace a false star shot to marked place, do run apace and thinking it to catch a jelly up do snatch. Very strange poetry, but he's talking about a fallen star is actually just jelly. He said this in 1541. In 1740, William Somerville, some of y'all know, some of y'all who are into the arts, you know William Somerville's name. William Somerville wrote, Swift as the shooting star that gilds the night with rapid transient blaze, she runs, she flies. Sudden she stops, no longer can endure the painful course, but dropping sinks away. And like that falling meteor, there she lies, 
a jelly cold on earth. WTF? How come we're not learning about this in high school and college? I'll tell you why. Because they want you to think those luminaries in the sky are solids. They want you to think they're all suns. But they're not, guys. We live in a construct. And that construct has imperfections. Yeah, those imperfections are designed to wake you up. Yeah, guys. They were awake then. Yeah. They knew. They got. They had it. They had it down, guys. So, moving right along. Moving right along. Yeah, Jamie, 888. That is a what? Wow. There's no doubt. Pamela Swan, bam. We're not done, guys. This is going to be a longer, longer than usual video. I normally stop at two hours. We're not doing that today. I got some amazing things to keep showing. Okay, so that's star jelly. Now we're gonna go to twenty. Now, now we're gonna go to. Uh, now we're gonna go to some anomalies at sea. Before we return back to our subject matter, the reason is is because we started this with the Foo Fighters, the Willow Wisps, the Spook Lights. That's what that's what a lot of people call them. So, uh, these these glowing orbs that seem to appear in volcanic activity, thunderstorm activity. They're, on, they're in the inside of tornadoes. Yeah, guys, I'm going to show you a video that shows something like this in a tsunami. I'm going to show you before we stop. But also, we have to take into consideration that these things have been called many things fairy lights. They could be the origin of the, of the agroglyphs. Remember, I have a video about the mowing devil. They thought crop circles were created by the devil so the woodcuts from the 1600s show a mowing devil but they, but they never saw a devil they saw strange lights before centuries before that the europeans called called them fairy rings but in modern days glowing willow wisps have been seen around around crop circles strange lights have been seen and two or three seconds later a whole crop circle circle has appeared yeah we already know that many really poorly made crop circles were done as hoaxes and there's organizations that have paid guys to go out there and make a crop circle and then turn around and they use tools and they do whatever do but they're not real the real ones are chemically altered the real ones the 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 stocks shatter but not the ones that are found uh uh bent over they're not these stocks cannot bend they will shatter but they're found completely bent over. The chemical co chemical composition has ch changed to allow them to bend and then weave into the others. We don't have machinery that can do this geometrical precision that's appearing all the time. Yeah, guys, I have a whole, I got, I got like two chapters in my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, on agroglyphs, crop circles. I even show you how to decode them because they're geometrical messages, and a lot of them are, have, air, have calendrical significance. Coffee's good, even cold. So, still got some really interesting stuff to cover. At sea, check this out. We're going to go to, we're going to go all the way to the back to page 26. And so in, in 1845, on the brig Victoria in the Mediterranean, Without any appearance of bad weather at all, without any wind or any squalls, a fireball appears, goes over the surface of the water and takes out the main mast, the mizzen mast uh, of, of a ship and, and the sails and just keeps going. The sailors are like baffled. What in the hell just happened? Yeah. Sounds like a weapon. Hell, maybe Captain Nemo was in the submarine underneath there and, just, and launched something at him. I don't know. But again, we have this fireball. This is what they're described, but it's a it's Foo Fighter. It's another one of these glowing yellow orbs. Passed over. This was a, That was an 18 feet. You can read the full account on page 26 of this book. But he gives many, account, many accounts of many ships. This book is full of ship captains' reports uh, of all kinds of weird things that have been found. And it's just, it's just baffling. But these fireballs 
uh, they seem to rise up out of the water and then just disappear. So it's the same thing as the fire ships. You could like the Mary Celeste, uh, oh, derelict ships, ghost ships. Look, the flying Dutchman isn't an actual vessel. The flying Dutchman is a phenomenon. You got to understand the difference, guys. Many, 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 many ship logs from, from the last 400 years. They talk about these 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 fire ships, and later it was called Flying Dutchman. But these are these are ships. These are phenomena that that make themselves look like ships that are floating over the water. And sometimes they got tendrils of flame coming off of them. And yeah, they're just these Foo Fighters. They're just taking on a new form, just like uh uh Trevor James Constable documented in his book when he took pictures of them they can change their shapes they can change their size they can even change their opacity and that's very that that right there means that these things can also operate as NPCs anything that can change its shape and be visibly seen and control its opacity can be anything to anyone that should get your should get your attention. Okay, so 1975. Okay, I already already got the Miss MacArthur, the Miss MacArthur deal. So page 73. What happened? What happened? Page 73. Oh, the fire ships. Okay. All right. The HMS Bacante plying the waters off Australia at 4 a M, a flying Dutchman was seen. It crossed our bows, a strange red light as of a phantom ship, all aglow in the midst, which light, oh, okay, in, in the midst of which light the mast, spars, and sails of the brig, 200 yards distance, stood out in strong relief. As she came up, the lookout man on the forecastle reported her as close, uh, as close on the port bow. Well, also the officer of the watch from the bridge clearly saw her as did also the quarter deck midshipman who was sent forward at once to the forecastle but on arriving there was no vestige nor any sign whatever of any material ship to be seen either either near or right away on the horizon this was recorded in scientific american Page 279, 1886. What you have to understand how important these, these ships logs are. The reason is, is these, these ship captains, they risked their career reporting things that were untrue. Because when these things were reported, the Royal, the Royal Navy would grill them. And then they would take, they would take the sailors, the midshipmen, the bowmen, uh, the first mate, they would take them and they would grill them and they would investigate. And they would find out, okay. So it's not just the ship captain. Everybody on this ship observed the same thing. And this guy is very clear to say that it wasn't just a flying Dutchman apparition they actually saw the rat lines, the sails, the mast, whatever they were looking at took on the form of a floating fiery ship. So it's crazy. Just crazy. Let's see. It's page 78. I believe it's another, another flying Dutchman. So, Captain Jan A. Carlson of the SS Dover, 35 miles off the mobile light in the Gulf of Mexico on October 24th, 1908, the ship ran suddenly into a streak of light coming from the water, which alternated blue and green, the colors being so brilliant that the vessel was lighted up as if she were covered with, covered with, with arc lights, which colored with colored globes, a half a mile streak of dark water and a blackness that settled like a pall over the ship then followed, and a second streak of the same brilliant hued waters was encountered. The second streak was about a, as wide as the first one, and when the ship ran out of it, 
The same black waters and night of exceptional blackness were also encountered. Each of the streaks and the intermediate streak of black water was about a half a mile wide. They provided an illustration of these neon type lights that were coming from the deep ocean underneath the ship. Tell me that's not bizarre. What kind of what kind of lights were this? You're not dealing with you're not dealing with photophosphorescent bio bioluminescent organisms. That's not what happening here and even william corliss explains that out there in the ocean there are bioluminescent organisms but they don't appear with perfect structure geometrical regularity they don't this is something else very very unusual that was 1908 also in the year 1908 also in the year 1908 the steamer called the counselor was in the Gulf of Siam, Siam, S-I-A-M, I don't know. And it too came across the same phenomenon, these weird lights that it's just so, so bizarre. There's no reason to go into depth on this one. It's the same thing. Unusual lights with no moon in the sky. There was unusual lights underwater. But by far the greatest one, I'm going to show you a picture of what happened to the Olympic challenger in 1953 on November 4th and the uh, 5th in the Gulf of Oman. The ship suddenly found itself in between three glowing epicenters that were corkscrewing these, these weird rays of lights clockwise and counterclockwise, proving we're dealing with something that's more machine-like than, than natural. They weren't going in the same direction and they were opposed to each other. Look at this picture. This is a ship in the middle of a weird light phenomenon that is almost absolutely inexplicable. That's the ship in the middle. The three, the three orbs are underwater casting rays of light that spin in opposite directions. Can you imagine being on that ship? Be terrified. Way out there in the middle of the ocean by yourself. And three glowing objects under the surface of the water are casting these rays like this. So bizarre. So bizarre. All right, let me see my... Let me see how I'm doing. Started at one. Okay, we still got some good time. We got to make a good time. Make a good time. Yes, those are not bio, bio bioluminescent organisms in the ocean do not respond that way. In fact, the wake of the ship would have disturbed the rays. And, these, and William Cordes is describing that, that the, the alternating rays of light and darkness were so perfect, there's no way that uh, that was natural. Just no way. So, oh, here's another, here's another one. Page 84. So this is also in the Gulf of Oman, of Oman or Oman, whatever. This is another one, 1951, November 30th. This ship is going through the Gulf and these gigantic glowing disks appear underwater. This is crazy. You see that picture? You can only imagine how crazy that would be. Oh, in the Gulf of Oman again, right here on February 1953, the SS Strathmore in the Gulf of Oman turned its radar on and found itself instantly surrounded by crescent-shaped glowing objects. When it turns its radar off, they all disappear. You can't see them with the naked eye or the radar. When they turn the radar on, the guys looking over, over over the side of the ship can see all these objects glowing that are shaped like little crescent moons. That's just bizarre. 
whatever whatever was in the water reacted instantly and started glowing as soon as it was hit with the radar. When the radar was turned off, they stopped glowing. So you couldn't see them with the naked eye. Again, absolutely inexplicable, but it shows, it shows that we're not the only ones here. Here's another one. P on page 86, I'm just going to give you the memory on this. Why well, don't we need to read it? On page 86, I was really intrigued by what I read about Polynesia. National Geographic in uh, 1974 did a Polynesia uh, piece. And the men that went on that crew for National Geographic talked to some of the locals and they were baffled to find out how the Polynesians could go on boats for several days over the ocean, not being able to see where the islands were and yet get there. And this shocked, what they were told shocked the, the scientists. The, the, the sailors of Polynesia, not using any type of technology, claimed that all you had to do was get on your, your longboat canoes at night. You can't sail during the day and see you got to start. You got to sail at night when you sail, when you sail at night in the pitch black of night, you can look deep in the water, in the ocean, and there's underwater lightning that shows the way to the nearest islands. If you're, if you are in between those islands, if you go off course, you will not see it underwater lightning it won't be visible to you but if you're on course to go to a nearby island or chain of islands there will be periodically through the night flashes of lightning underwater if you see them you need to keep your bearing because you're heading straight toward another another chain of islands or a big island and this is what they've been doing for thousands of years they follow the lightning underwater because there's underwater lightning is linking all these land bridges that are underwater. It's crazy. It's right here. It's in the scientific book. William Cordes talks about it. No, no one knows how to explain it, but uh, he thinks it may be volcanic activity that's creating uh, electrostatic discharges underwater. I don't know, but it's fascinating that the Polynesians could use that to ascertain the location of, of areas of geography that were above the surface of the Pacific. It's amazing. So, uh, earthquake. All right. So, so earthquakes, earthquake lights are accepted now by geophysicists. It's a fact, though the mechanism is the mechanism is entirely unclear. None of them will will even postulate what they what they really think it is. They won't be get peer reviewed. Do it. They'll just write papers and 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 theorize as to why. But they're Aerial auroras have been found over a lot of earthquakes. Thank you. They have been found over a lot of earthquakes. This goes back to the writings of Tacitus. Yes, Roman historian Tacitus for like 373 BC, he records an earthquake that had strange light phenomena. And I think he even talks about the, the, the strong sulfurous, the putrid sulfur smell that was that was smelled at the exact same time. Now that could be outgassing. It could be, uh, it could be uh, putrefying gas, gassing. We call them fossil fossil fuel uh, gases or whatever. It could be that. Well, I, I just don't know. But uh, uh, earthquakes are attended with ball lightning. Mountain tops have been seen multiple times during earthquakes to glow, and uh, sheets of flame issuing up from the ground. These are like a, uh, um, like the giant spheres. The heads in the Olmec, La Venta, and Veracruz state, those giant spheres were, before they were ever carved into faces by a later race, they were originally perfectly, perfectly pie proportioned spheres. And they're, they're all crystalline, uh, high crystalline content. And they're, they were for uh, like a piezoelectric earthquake dampeners is what they were for. Anyway, they would glow blue during during heightened seismic activity, and this is why the Olmecs used those spheres and put them everywhere. Is because they they basically the spheres themselves actually predicted earthquakes. If the, most earthquakes happen at night, most people don't know this. Most earthquakes happen at nighttime, 
And most earthquakes happen in the warmer parts of the year. So, you know, these spheres would would give off a soft blue illumination right before a real bad earthquake. So that's why a later civilization came in and they had and they had they had a bunch of these spheres. That's one, there's only like 12 of them, but they had uh, like a dozen of those spheres carved into angry faces. But that's not there's thousands of those spheres. I have books. I have books in my library about those spheres. What they're for. All right. Now. Uh, thank you, Ian Craven. You, Ian Craven lives in Ecuador and he has seen that phenomenon happen before. Yeah, that's exactly what those spheres are for. Now, artificial illumination will now dampen that effect. But in ancient times, when there was no artificial illumination bouncing back from the sky, then those that blue light coming off coming off that would, would have been very 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 visible so let's go with uh okay i've i've covered all that the earthquakes let's go to 272 i think 272 has got some really interesting stuff about earthquakes you guys need to hear all right 272 okay yeah there's way too many reports in here so i'm just going to give you an overview that he talks about Peculiar noises before, during, and after earthquakes are not natural. You would think there would be rumbling and grating noises, which would be expected during earthquake activity if subterranean rocks were repositioning themselves. He says, frequently, however, earthquakes generate various improbable noises, whizzes, detonations, screeches, the sound of breaking glass, etc. Furthermore, Furthermore, the noises sometimes seem to emanate from the sky rather than from below the ground. Okay, our world is not what you think. I have, I have a few videos about the hidden machinery of the sky. Remember, the whole Phoenix phenomenon is something that is hidden in our sky. I used to believe in intruder planets, in planet X. I used to believe in all these false models of our reality and it's because i i bought into the narrative the scientific community had painted for me to buy into i no longer believe any of that bs i understand that our sky is a sky sim and that it is simulated and it simulates phenomena it is simu it is all optics that are simulated it's in the sky itself is what is producing all this weather phenomena it is producing all these all these drops of biological materials yeah guys all kinds of stuff. Our world is steadily blanketed, blanketed with all kinds of bugs and insects and tadpoles and, and frogs and fish and arachnids and different different so reddish reddish soil compounds. Yeah, during the Phoenix phenomenon is, is the height of this dumping. All right, so that was all good. That was, that was good stuff there, but we don't need to go into in details yeah um uh, here's a few of them here were tacitus for 373 ad uh the kamakura earthquake of 1275 uh, uh the blue light appeared tacitus describes in 370 uh, uh 373 bc the earthquake in all kinds of weird luminous phenomena the japanese earthquake had luminous phenomena Flying luminous objects are mentioned in connection with the earthquake at Yido, Tokyo, during the winter of 1672. A fireball resembling a paper lantern was seen flying through the sky toward the east. Uh, during the Tosa earthquake in 1698, a number of fireballs shaped like wheels were seen flying in different directions. In the case of the great uh, Jinroku earthquake of December 31st, 1730 at Tokaido, Luminous bodies and luminous air were reported during the nights preceding the day of the severest shock. Yeah, guys, I, I'm not I'm not going to read them all, but it just goes on. All all these examples of earthquakes where these these orbs, these fireballs, and a in a strange blue luminosity all happened at the same time at the same time earthquakes. Which is at the same time I've showed you these 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 major thunderstorms were happening. Some of these thunderstorms producing tornadoes, and inside those tornadoes were the same glowing fireballs, just rotating around like they were generating the tornado itself. 
So crazy. It is so crazy, guys. All right, so yeah, the volcano, the volcanoes, these orbs have been seen going in and out of volcanoes. And, and, and then all of a sudden the volcano arcs and, and, and it starts outgassing really bad and detonates. So these things are these things are are, are responsible for a lot more than what we what we what we know. So a few other things that were that were in this book that were interesting is I found a reference in this book to 1902. And it says that the astronomical journals of the day in 1902 reported something very unusual. They reported, quote, a glare around the sun merging into a faint smoky red or purple ring five degrees to 10 degrees wide. That's huge in the sky, guys, with the maximum color about 30 degrees away from the sun. Okay. Remember, guys, 1902, on the second part of 1902, red rain, red dirt, red dust, and red mud rained all over our world. Did it have something to do with that red halo and cloud that appeared around the sun? I don't know. I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let you guys uh, figure that one out. So... Also, something we can't get into because it's too much data, but he's got a whole section on dark days, like New England's dark day, 1780, when the government buildings and all the shops had to close, people had to break their candlelights out, and they admitted it wasn't the moon. It's just the sun went dark. In the, in, it's called the dark day of New England, 1780. It happened again in Wisconsin. It's called the dark day of Wisconsin, 1886. Again, he's got a lot of data in this book about those two, two, and many others. Those are just two of the more, the, the, the more popular ones in recent history. Uh, it happened again in 1765. Uh, uh, dark, it, it got dark in, in 1902 and 1903 in different areas of the world. Now, these dark days are very interesting because scientific community absolutely admits it wasn't the moon, but they come up with all kinds of weird theories as to why it happened. So, uh, now something on page 149 shocked me. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the picture because William Corliss is science scientist. He's not a flat earther. He's a scientist, but he says something in here that every flat earther should pay attention to. Is, uh, this is really interesting. Remember, I'm a simulationist. And I need, to, I need to keep saying that because there are some people who just don't get it. Any, any, any digital, computerized, basically any simulated context is going to have to start with a fat, flat plane. And then all curvature is then deceitful programming in the sky makes a deal. Cause there's, there's no evidence of it where I live right here on the, on the plane. All the evidence of curvature is in the sky. And we've already seen over and over and over and over and over the sky lies. I'm going to show you this. This is called Fata Morgana. And it's a very famous mirage. It is, it is seeing something over the curvature it's a mirage of this is what this is what the scientific community says ships are able to use telescopes and blow up distant objects but the curvature of the earth would make it impossible to see it straight away so therefore they're seeing a reflection through the atmosphere they're not really explaining how it's possible they're just theorizing this one's called fata morgana where something is too many hundreds of miles away to actually be seen straight and, and magnified up, but it is seen. It's seen perfectly clearly, meaning you're looking on a flat plane, but that can't be possible, right? Here's the Fata Morgana. I'm going to show you a much better picture. Show you a much, much better picture. I'll find it. This is unusual mirage resembling the Cuckoo Fata Morgana in Gulf of Mexico. Now, they're claiming this is a mirage because, because ship captains can see the city over the curvature of the earth. And the city is really there. It's really there. But 
There's no way it can be seen. If the world is a globe, there is no way these ship captains can see this. So scientists call it a mirage. End of story. That's the, that, that's the end of the story, guys. It's just a mirage. Don't. It's nothing to get worked up over. Just because it's the mirage shows perfectly what that city looks after you magnify it by three hundred times. You know, it's a. It's just a mirage. Light bends over the curvature of the Earth. That's their. That's their explanation. So I'm not going to tell you what to believe. But William Cordes says there's very unusual. Usual radio signals in our world that are inexplicable and the scientific community doesn't know where they're coming from. Something underground and something in the sky is emitting radio signals that are not of human provenance. Not only that, but the scientific community has documented that the earth hums in different areas and at different times. This too is inexplicable. We don't know anything about this hum. But I, I will draw your attention to something very interesting William Cordes said. He said on page 30, right here, William Cordes said, the earth, the earth is a gigantic electrical machine. What? That's what that man said. And, and I can, I can agree with him. I can definitely agree with him. So, I'm going to show you a video that's going to blow your mind. If we have evidence, even from the scientific community, that these apparitions make tornadoes appear, they strengthen tornadoes, they're in thunderstorms, they're hiding in lightning, they control lightning. If these apparitions that have been seen can play with us while we're, while we're in the sky about to fight our enemy, if these apparitions have been seen going in and out of volcanoes before they detonate, if these apparitions are clearly visible in the sky during a earthquake activity, if these apparitions show up before thunderstorms, during thunderstorms, after thunderstorms, if these apparitions are, are a part of the apparatus that induces the, this destructive phenomena of volcanoes, earthquakes, thunderstorms, lightning, uh, and the like, earthquakes, whatever. If these apparitions are responsible for all that, then maybe, just maybe, we can make sense of a video that I'm about to show you. It was too long, so I edited it down. But this video is real. What is seen is shocking, but this is also a destructive event. It's a tsunami in Japan in 2011, and what comes out of the water is seen at three different times in the film at three separate, three separate uh, uh, occasions. I'm going to show you that video right now, guys, because it blew my mind when I saw it. It just blew my mind.
All right, guys. Yeah, that was that was kind of that was kind of wild. Now, one hundred percent of all my data in archaics is from old old sources. It is from scientific reports. Uh, you you guys already know all my published books are packed with bibliographic citations. I'm very I'm very stringent about that. And in my videos, I tell you where I get my information. But listen, I don't take pictures and videos as uh, as proof of anything. But in the context of all this material that I'm giving you, all I'm doing is offering that video in support of the idea that maybe even tsunamis are generated and controlled by something that is non-human, something that is not natural. Because what you saw in that video was pretty compelling. It was at three different, it, it appeared three different times in the video. It's very interesting. If the video is a hoax from 2011, it's a very good one. It's fooled a lot of people. But uh, anyway, just very interesting. Very interesting. So my, my presentation is over. This is Handbook of Unusual Natural Phenomena, Eyewitness Accounts of Nature's Greatest Mysteries by William Corliss. If there's any of you you have in your attic or you know friends are never going to read it that has any William Corliss books, please send them to me My, my in the description box of all my videos. You can find my post office box. Uh, I will do videos on all the William Corliss books. I have four of his books and we will be doing another video on William Cordes's data, but it will be on strange and unusual artifacts. And I saw somebody in the comment section earlier mention Forbidden Archaeology by Richard Thompson and Michael Cremo. And yes, I have read read that book. The book is huge. And a lot of it was very boring, but I read it because uh, I am completely anti-uniformitarian. I'm a catastrophist. And uniformitarians to me are deceivers. They know they're deceivers. And this is why they have a budget of billions of dollars to promote the deception, while catastrophists are basically lone researchers out there just putting together real solid data like myself. But we don't have these deep pocket organizations that are that are putting us out there. They just ignore us. So anyway, that's my presentation, guys. And we went kind of long. We, we went real long, so there's no Q&A this time. But I know there's a bunch of videos uh, that show similar things. I just wanted to show that one because it was just so, it was so crazy. And maybe Martin Martin's going to show me how to do this, uh, how I can show a bunch of images fast instead of copying and pasting. Yeah, screw all that. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to show all the pictures that were in this book. I, I got up and showed them to you, but there's a lot more pictures that were in this book that I have on file. I wanted to show them that way, but I'm just going to throw them in my my uh, my new images pack. I'm just going to throw them in there, a bunch of other images. But hey, I've had a great time. I hope you guys had a good time. I'm sorry I went over my my two hour deadline, but uh, we got some we got some great videos on the way, and I hope you took I hope you took away from to I hope you took something away from this, guys. That that. A lot of the material that I provided you in archaics isn't just me talking about the, out the side of my mouth. Sci the scientific evidence is mounting. It's getting to the point where they where they just have to ignore it because they can't even entertain any of it because any, any entertaining of the anomalies that we're discussing is an admission that they are that they are actually happening happening to a wider demographic and they don't want to do that it's just like this ice age theory bs that's going around most people don't understand when they hear ice age and there's a lot of content creators out there a lot of popular authors and researchers you know their names that are putting out this ice age material the exact opposite is true the exact opposite it wasn't an ice age guys Megafauna, we're in a very warm to subtropical world. It's called the vapor canopy period. The all that snow and ice, all that snow and ice came from the collapsed vapor canopy. When that mesosphere collapsed, all that all that snow and ice went to the went to went to uh the Arctic and the Antarctic. That's where it went. While the equatorial region remained basically packed full of life forms. However, the oxygen had been greatly diminished, so creatures couldn't grow to that size anymore. The megafauna died out. The ones that weren't frozen, yeah, they're really pushing. Even in the old, even in the alt history, 
alt history groups, they're really pushing that ice age deal. But the truth of the matter is, and anybody can verify this, there are over there are over 58 or 59, maybe 60 ice age theories. And they're all different from each other. How ice ages could even be possible. And they won't tell you this. You got to go to the specialist literature to find this out. But that that's how iffy the whole situation is. They can't nail it down because every time they nail down how the ice ages were even possible, they turn other scientists bring evidence to the forefront. So well, that can't be true because of this. That can't be. This has happened so many times that the ice age theory had to be revamped 59 times. Yeah, guys, they, they won't tell you this, but Jason will. Jason will tell you because they're all full of shit. Ice ages are bullshit. They never happened. They never happened. We had a vapor canopy world, and that's what that's what we had. And that's why there's no humidity in the Arctic or Antarctic, and there's only half an inch of snow that falls. So they invented a theory that that, that two mile high snow caps took hundreds of thousands of years to build, and it's not true. Every bit of it is BS. So I have many videos that address this. You might want to check out my, my 1871 cyclical flood theory. It's really interesting. But God, I love you guys, and I'm not going to drag this out. And I'm glad I'm glad this uh, glitching was kept to a minimum because it really affects my OCD. And uh, I will get with you guys later. It's been beautiful. And you know I'm going to hit y'all with that badass outro. If I can find it. Oh, that's not it. Y'all really need help with this. I'm going to remove this. 2023. Things should just be user-friendly by now. I know Martin's laughing at me. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit this. I'm going to hit this outro. All these changes you got to go through. I don't know why they don't, they don't allow you to put all these things in your, your settings. Why I actually have to leave... Streamyard to go to my desktop to go find what I want. This is this isn't how this thing this should be set up at all. At all. Love you guys. <laughs>